standard of special values. Hita Next, Webster. Good morning. First item on the program today is not a matter of the greatest concern, but it's a great kerfuffle over cul-de-sacs and Shaughnessy. The snob move by city council, perhaps, to protect the wealthy. First of all, you're going to meet an angry man by the name of Fred Kavanaugh in Shaughnessy yesterday. Ninety-six people said, yes, we will go ahead with this. Ninety-six people now got $60,000 spent on these diverters, which is a $600 subsidy, just what my taxes went up last year to pay for this idiocy. <laughs> Later in the program, you will meet the cul-de-sac kid, Mayor Harcourt of Vancouver, with his views on that, and also that great protector of Shaughnessy, Bruce Erickson of Dera. On the program today, too, Art Vetlieb, president of the Trial Lawyers Association, He's up in arms, as many lawyers are, over the restriction on the amount of money you can get for the loss of pleasure and for pain incurred in crippling accidents, a mere $100,000 or some such figure. But first off the top this morning, the man is just back from his sojourns in Africa and in Europe, putting a peephole on the Polish situation. My friend Ilya Girol, who came here 23 months ago today and has established himself as a competent, intelligent, journalist. He is a, a guy who was expelled from the Soviet Union for his dissidency. And Jerome on the Polish crisis, and I hope he doesn't talk about preemptive strikes or any of that Regan nest nonsense after the break. <laughs> Ilya Jerome journalist, province syndicated columnist, is back after three weeks in Africa and a couple of weeks keyhole peeping in Poland. Now, I think you're qualified to keyhole peep in Poland, one, because you speak the languages, right? Is there any danger, just to put it very bluntly, of this solidarity movement and the Polish martial law situation escalating into a really tough Cold War or even a conflict with the Americans? Well. I'll start from the end. It will be not, we, we will not witness the real war or military confrontation between superpowers because of Poland. It's unrealistic, unnecessary, and I believe that we must be very careful using the military terminology when we speak about uh, events in Poland. As to uh, Cold War, in fact, we live in the Cold War time already. 
after Afghanistan. I think we, with our hands, rebuilt Cold War when we permitted our Kremlin to invade Afghanistan, when we permitted Kremlin uh, to take over several African countries, when we permitted Kremlin to change the balance of power. After we did it, we brought back the Cold War. We should not uh, accuse only Russians. I think we did it. President Carter administration did it uh, with their own hands. Therefore, Poland, of course, uh, increased um, this level of Cold War, but the Cold War already existed. Well, let's look at the situation right now. First of all, you had the amazing upsurge of the Solidarity Movement, unexpected and really not <laughs> predicted in a communist bloc country. Mm -hmm. In the last 30 years, the Poles have, you might say, got off their knees, mm -hmm. expressed themselves, had a fair measure of freedom under Lech Walesa, and then whammo, down. Right? Correct. Right. Now, why did they move, why did they declare martial law, really, in the first place? Were they afraid there was going to be a, an absolute, what's the word, rebellion against the communist leadership in Poland? I think it's much more complicated. There are two points of view, and both are wrong. First point of view was that they, General Jaruzelski, announced the martial law to prevent Russian invasion. Sounds reasonable. It is nonsense, from the beginning. Uh, for one who knows the real situation in Communist bloc, it's clear that uh, General Jaruzelski can't announce the changes in traffic uh, before, uh, mm, uh, without Moscow permission. He can't wipe his nose without Moscow saying, wipe your nose. Absolutely. That's your con you're uh, convinced and It's belief. not only I'm convinced, it's not only belief, it's my knowledge. It's knowledge of everybody who was in communist countries, who well, lived in communist countries. But look what our great leader said, look what Trudeau said. Um, and he's a whistler, he said, oh, martial law by the Poles is perhaps better than martial law by the Russians. And after all, what do you do about these excessive demands of solidarity? Now, that was a good practical, real politic view he took of the situation, because nobody in this country wants to go to war over Poland. Uh -huh. I believe that uh, Mr. Trudeau, of course, is our prime minister, is an outstanding politician. But I believe his uh, attitude, his approach to martial law is a very personal one. And um, you mean he maybe he like just like this, uh, like this state of uh, state of emergency. Just personally, I believe that his statement was a big mistake, and his statement made some kind of damage to the image of Canada. I was in Vienna monitoring Polish events, and I met some Poles, including I was in Denmark also. I met refugees from Poland, and first question what I heard: Why Canadians betrayed us? And you know that Polish nation, Poland, has a complex kind of um, betrayal. They were betrayed not once and not twice. And, and today, we Canadians became first who betrayed them uh, with the words of our prime minister. And you're trying to tell me that the Russian propaganda machine has used effectively Trudeau's statement sure. to damage the image of Canada as a great leader of the free world who says, so what's <coughs> wrong with martial law? Even worse. Uh, mm, Tribuna Liudu, Polish uh, official newspaper, one of two only permitted newspapers in Poland now. I saw the smuggled copies um, from Poland. On the first page, put these words, place these words of Trudeau, showing that Trudeau, one of the leaders of the free world, what he is, uh, supports martial law. In fact, like a um, Canadian way, they call it Canadian way, Canadian approach to Polish events. If Canadian approach of Polish events is just a Chamberlain style of betrayal, everybody who is behind, and be uh, that is terrible. Well, Trudeau and McGugan have each tried yeah. to backtrack to some extent of what he said. I don't suppose the backtracking will get the same prominence. Well, let's uh, speak about what he said, not about his explanation of what he said before. It's it's not serious, it's not a level of politician. If we say, today I say uh, one thing and tomorrow my foreign minister explains what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, what he wanted to say, he said. He said that martial law is better. Why the collapse of the economy in Poland? Why the shortage of food? I mean, it's a good food growing country. They get aid from the Soviet bloc, don't they? No. What happened to it? No, we came to some ca a cardinal problem. Uh, Food producing countries, there are no food producing countries in communist bloc. Poland was food producing country before the war, like uh, Russia before the revolution. After the war, when communist system, is it collectivized system or is it individual system like in, like in Poland, it doesn't work. 
communist system economically doesn't work at all, except for heavy industry, of course. War machines. They yeah, can war machines. Very good sure. war machines. Sure, when you can send one million slaves for small salary to work, that's okay. So Poland never produced after the war food enough to, 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 to feed um, its own population. Despite that, the USSR took from Poland up to the last year uh, one third of food produced in Poland. Polish potatoes, Polish poultry, uh, Polish meat uh, was in Soviet um, uh, stores because there are no Soviet meat in Soviet. Yeah, but you're a hardliner. Do you want? I'm to... not a hardliner. By the you're way, not a hardliner? I'm not a hardliner. The way you're talking there about Afghanistan and the step forward of the Russian bear, you know, in Afghanistan, LA and Czechoslovakia, yeah. they, you say they've got to be stopped sometime. Jack, yeah, let's be objective. Uh, to stop, in 1938, to stop Nazi, does it mean to be a hardliner? It means to be a realist. 38 was a different thing. Germany was, Germany was a weak country militarily in 35, 36, when the British and the French could have moved in and stopped Hitler. Sure. You can't move in and stop Russia because it's not a weak country. Well, that is logic uh, of, uh, I, I would say, um, it's logic of business per people, but it's not logic of, uh, not logic of po politic. What does it mean that we should oppose dictatorship if they are weak and we should not oppose if they are strong? Well, we're all afraid of the nuclear bomb. Don't kid yourself. If we are, so the Europeans are scared witless of Reagan at the moment. Am I not correct? No. If it is no, and I will explain you why. If it is only the question, how far are we afraid? So let us not blame politic. Let's just surround, surrender and forget it. But it's not serious approach to politic. Back to Valenza. Is he still under house arrest? Valenza was firstly in the beginning of the martial law. He was in the headquarters of Ministry of Defense. Uh, there are different, so different sources and give, gave their different explanation how he was treated there. Uh, for, um, for, um, you know, officially, Polish government announced that he was treated as a, how to say it, as a leader of solidarity. At the same time, they announced that solidarity was a controversial organization, officially. So um, there are sources which reported that he was subjected to a psychological pressure, psychological torture. How is he now? Have you any idea? I have some pretty reliable information about his fate. Uh, Valesa, he didn't have uh, he didn't have heart attack as it was announced, but he had heart troubles during his um, arrest. And you'll give me a prediction on what's going to happen to Valenza next and the Solidarity Movement after the break. Ilya, Jarol, foreign correspondent. Valenza is still in house arrest of some kind. Yeah. What will happen? Some kind of serious house arrest. Yeah, he's there and he may be being brainwashed. Who knows? Absolutely too. All right, what happens to him now? Uh, Valenza, it was one information which was real information, real information. Uh, and it was confirmed when I spoke to the leader of Austrian trade unions who has his personal channels of communication with the Polish Catholic Church and through the church was uh, partly with Valenza. Uh, Valenza was once ready to speak to military government. And military government, uh, through the rumor system, rumors is a very important system of information in communist bloc. It's a way how to brainwash the nation. So through the rumor system, it became known that Valesa is ready to speak to military government. It depressed very much active leaders of solidarity who are now underground. But then it appeared that Valesa put conditions to... Um, speak to government. These conditions were all solidarity leaders should be released and participate in negotiations. Church, including the Cardinal Joseph Glemp, should also participate in negotiations and solidarity should be proclaimed a legitimate political organization. What and happened? Though? Government categorically refused even to discuss this topic and it became known and I believe next week we will witness it. Leaders of solidarity including Walesa will be expelled. You're telling me right now that within a week or two weeks, we'll give you two weeks, weeks. Okay. Uh, Valenza and the others will be expelled to the West. There are a very big possibility of it. Things have improved 25 years ago in the Soviet Union that have put them up against the wall and shot them, right? Well, let us say that things are improved. Things are improved for 1,000 years. People are not stoned for making some sins. Uh, does it mean that we made big progress? What about Canadian food? Uh, 
Are we a principal supplier of basic <laughs> foodstuffs to Poland? Yes, yes, we are basic supplier of... Um, Should we continue to supply it? No. And I will explain you why. Half a year, Canadian food, so generously given by population and by Canada to Poland, never appeared in food stores. It was in warehouses for six months because the coup was very carefully prepared for these six months. People starved and died and Canadian food was in warehouses. Now, this food is used to feed army, to feed security police, and not people. As you know, just yesterday it was announced that food prices are increased on 300, 400%. But even the Americans have not yet made any move to stop their food, food exports. To I would say so. Let us put it in a different um, uh, direction. Food should be supplied, but distribution of food should be, given, should be um, conducted by church, by Red Cross, by International Commission, but by everybody, not by Polish government. Because I witnessed how Holland um, co food convoy came to Polish borders and security forces took all the food and threw out Holland, uh, Holland people, just uh, Dutch people, just from the border. You're saying the West should say, okay, we will help to feed Poland, but only if we or our agents can distribute it. Absolutely right. Is that Not practical? only we, let us say Polish church. Is that practical? Yes, it is practical. We can demand it. And can we get such a demand accepted? I, I think we could. Uh, but not with Trudeau's attitude, you couldn't, could you? Well, let's return to Trudeau's attitude. Trudeau's attitude is, let's not make them angry, let's not disturb them, and let us value martial law as political experiment. And he knows that political exper experiment sometimes, <laughs> sometimes can be used. Have the Americans gone far enough in their so-called sanctions? Technological equipment? <clears throat> well, I believe that uh, American sanctions are not serious as far as the practical result of sanctions is concerned. But they are serious as a matter that um, we do something, that we show that we can do something in future, and that we are relatively united in Western Alliance, Alliance relatively united as far as condemnation of Polish uh, uh, state of war is concerned. As I understand it, there's the US, there's Britain, there's France. And there's the Italy, West Germany, Italy. Italy and that the West Germans are anything but enthusiastic. Uh, tomorrow you will see differently these things. Today, the negotiations, the talks between uh, Helmut Schmidt and uh, Reagan uh, started, and all moderate statements of Schmidt, too moderate, I would say, were designed for his own party, which is in split now. But generally, tomorrow you will see that Schmidt will condemn Polish a uh, state of war in the same terms as President Reagan does it. Are the Americans not mad, though, at the fact that this gas pipeline is coming from the Soviet Union to feed Western Europe, and they want that stopped, don't they? With pipeline, Americans are against it. Uh, part of Europeans are against it, too. But I believe that Reagan administration exaggerates the things. Uh, that is not overreaction. It is over-dramatization of things. After the pipeline will be ready, only 30% of gas are in um, West Germany and no more than 12% in France will come from the USSR. So it is not this amount of energy which will destroy the country in case of some kind of complications. Back to Poland again though. The situation, how do you predict the situation in Poland now with solidarity suppressed, mm -hmm. agreed? Mm -hmm. Solidarity is suppressed, <coughs> food is in short supply. Will the Soviet Union, might they still be forced to make the military move into Poland? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, in short term, uh, Moscow won this round because army, of course, very successfully made this coup, which was prepared for a long, long time, very carefully. Mm -hmm. They did it. Solidarity, which was very open movement, <coughs> was not prepared to anything. So they, go, they uh, are defeated. In long run, Moscow lost the main battle. Uh, because when we look at the Poland historically, we see that every movement in Poland is based on national more than social feelings. And that means that today, Polish nationalism will multiply because of this kind of oppression. We will see long conflict in Poland with Polish traditions of passive and then active resistance. I think General Jaruzelski will be in Polish history as a quisling and 
his future is very, very dark. One more short segment with Ilya Jaro on when and how the Russians, from his point of view, should be stopped after the break. Ilya, it's only a couple of years since you were expelled from the Soviet Union, right? You look at Afghanistan, you look at uh, Angola, and you were in Angola recently? Yeah, yeah, just recently. Have the Russian plans, from your point of view, changed at all? And what are their plans on a world basis? The, plan, the plans were announced, and the plans are conducted very carefully. Uh, the plans is to take over the world. But let us not speak about take over the world, it is a task of century. Today, plans are very simple. To destroy Western community as a community, to destroy free world as a kind of unity, country by country. Today, is the main plan is to neutralize Europe. And this plan, I believe, during Carter and Ford and Nixon administration, during three helpless American administrations, this plan was um, very successful. But Reagan, you welcome Reagan's attitude. Frankly speaking, I'm not so pro-Reagan as it uh, may seem. Sure not. But uh, I believe that as far as uh, Western alliance is concerned, Reagan was very successful. Europe, despite North American media, uh, media hysterical overreaction of, uh, of the split between Europe and uh, the United States, never Western alliance, alliance was so close to each other like now. What about the anti-nuclear demonstrations, the anti-missile demonstrations very throughout Europe? Very interesting topic. Uh, this whole movement died suddenly. It was up and died immediately after the Polish events. I spoke with leaders of this demonstration in D Denmark and in Austria. You mean they saw the light and pulled oh, yeah. back at once? Sure, and suddenly they saw Poland, and, <coughs> and suddenly they saw Soviet submarine with nuclear weapons spying near a Swedish Sweden. coast. After, after Soviet Union announced that his main goal is to make Northern Europe a, a nuclear-free zone and to make Baltic Sea a sea of peace. After that, they said nuclear um, submarine to Swedish coast. Uh, Soviet ambassador, Soviet envoy, Merkulov, Vladimir Merkulov, was expelled from Denmark just recently after he was caught physically by Danish police giving money to, world, uh, to this peace council, World Peace Council representatives in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So he bought these leaders of uh, bribe, these leaders of um, disarmament movement. Let's, let's switch to your African trip very briefly. You were there for three weeks. You were in South Africa? Yeah. A hotbed of racism and potential explosion? Yeah. I would say South Africa is even more, the uh, situation is more dramatic than we can imagine. These cosmetic reforms, when the in stores, uh, stores or libraries are now for blacks and for whites together, these cosmetic reforms even made the situation worse. Because it showed the limit, the limit of what this racist government can can go, you know? Then all of a sudden it appears that South Africa will be one of the allies in the final moments with the United States. Because it's absolutely imperative from an American point of view that Africa not be taken over by the communists. I think that Africa shouldn't be taken by communists, but I think that we in the West should press South African government more intensively, more violently press them to make serious reforms. Almost everybody in South Africa, including white Afrikaners, understand that time for reform is running out. Therefore, uh, the real serious pressure mm -hmm. will help, like sport boycott helped. And today, almost all sport clubs are opening their doors for non-white people too. Angola is one of the principal communist bases in Africa, correct? Absolutely. With Cuban forces still with there? With Cuban, with East German forces, with East German security police, with everything. Angola is the main Soviet base in Africa. And then we're down to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They've got Afghanistan. One day they'll move into the. One day they will move in Persia, Iran. And in Austria, for example. It will be just six hours to take okay. over Austria. From your wisdom as an observer and a, an ex communist. Ex communist? Ex, very ex. What should be the broad 
action taken by the Western governments now to prevent any further advances? Economical pressure, first. In very serious case, economical blockade. And then serious disarmament talks. Because economical blockade and economical pressure uh, is very, very sensible for Russia, very damaging for Russia. Russian economic is also near collapse. You see in television uh, big lining up for food in Poland, and we are really shocked. But we in Russia had it all our life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Russia today is v in very serious economical situation. If we will press them, they will be ready to real peace talks, to real detente, to real disarmament. But I shudder when I hear people like Zbigniew Brezhnev, Brzezinski. whatever his name is. It's a Polish name, I can't say it. Yeah. When I hear him say the next step should be perhaps to scrap the Yalta agreement. And for the benefit of younger generations, Yalta was when Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin carved up the pie of Europe, correct? Sure, violently, violently but under they, Stalin's pressure. But they carved it up and they said, these are our spheres of influence, mm -hmm. and nobody will go into our spheres of influence. But Jack, look if at... If you scrap that now... Look from a oh. moral point of view, look from a moral point of view. What rights three old guys had to, uh, just to divide Europe as one of them wanted. Oh, come now. They had just fought a war. They just defeated the German colossus. Well, Polish people also fought Germans. And all, all nation fought. And what nation got? Nation got Soviet occupation instead of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but all these guys are skipping off the ships. Are they real freedom lovers? Or are they, some of them just trying to get away from the wife and the old lady? Is that, is that a nasty question? Yes, it is a nasty question because let us not generalize it. Mm -hmm. Even among very freedom, some kind of uh, very holy freedom movement, we can see all kind of uh, yeah. of people who don't who, who don't like their wives. <laughs> but it, it, it means just nothing. I withdraw the remark. <laughs> I withdraw the remark. Okay, when's your next trip? Where are you going next? I hope I will relax and I will write. My thanks to Ilya Jarol. Now from the sublime to the ridiculous, we're going to do the cul-de-sac kerfuffle and shoffnessy after the break. I'm one of these simple-minded people who thinks that the streets of a city are built for all of the people. And I couldn't help but get involved in this cul-de-sac kerfuffle in Shaughnessy. So Steve went out to drive around, talk to some of the active angry participants, and then I came into the act with cul-de-sac Harcourt when Steve finishes his shtick in Shaughnessy. Jack, this is the cream of residential Vancouver, Shaughnessy. But lately they've been experiencing some very urban problems, namely traffic. So the city decided to install some strategically placed traffic diverters, like this one here. But not everybody's happy about it. In fact, here in this lap of conservatism, there's even talk about rebellion. These streets were paid for by all the citizens of Vancouver, not just the people who live in Shaughnessy or Carisdale. And I don't know where the idea come, uh, who hatched it up, that the streets are for the use of a... Uh, a few, the but, people in the area. But 98% 90, of the people here say that they want these barricades That's in not here. true. 96 or 98 people, as reported in the paper, but it was 96 people, according to Margaret Ford, the alderman, who they did a survey of 198 homes in the area. 134 responded. 96 people said they wanted the barricades. And for the 96 people, the city council have gone ahead and spent sixty thousand dollars which of everybody's is, money exactly they got a six hundred dollar subsidy to have their private park take a look at it mm -hmm. so what do you want done now should they be removed altogether and get the traffic back get in here these barricades out of here right now look the people who live in this area the ones who are who are probably more handicapped than the others you know we also have to drive around to get our to get out but if it's going to make it a safer place and that the, the traffic is diffused instead of all on one. I would you like to live on a street with, a, with cars going literally bumper to bumper? Mm -hmm. And that's not just at 4 o'clock or, you know, quarter to 4. Sure, we, I, we live in, with the you times, always, it's, yeah. you know. You always get the argument, though, that the people in Shaughnessy are trying to that's protect their own little world. That's not true, but that isn't true. Here's what all the fuss is about, a six-month experiment that began just four weeks ago. These are the four main intersections, better known now as the Shaughnessy Battleground. Everyone, their dog uses this, Richmond, the East End. 
What about we? I live in the area just on past 25th. Am I not allowed to lease, use these streets which I paid for? Why should you have the privilege of having the diverters in here? Do you go up Pine? Do you go up to Carisdale and shop? Mm -hmm. Do you go up Pine? You're going up the street right now. Do you go up Pine? No. Where do you go? I'll just you go up there. Pine. I use Arbutus. You never use Pine, eh? Never. What about the people on Arbutus? Do they, they get all the traffic now down there? Well, it was made as a major um, artery. This oh. wasn't. So was King Edward. <laughs> this wasn't. <laughs> Yes, it was. No, it that's, wasn't. Well, yes, it was. I just told you what they did when they built the Briar Bridge. You're, but that's a long listen, time Listen, I got upset 10 years ago when they shut off the West End. I thought, how could I use Denman and Georgia? I do it all the time now. It's nothing. You've got tunnel vision, honey. You know, there used to be a, a, a boulevard a boulevard, Yes. Here. They took it up. I now, know. Now, that meant that there was traffic to come up here. Now, I've lived up here all this time. Yeah. I must say this. I understand that part of the petition was there was children up here. I don't know who these children are. I've never seen them. No, they're all over. They I are. They're all, there are new people. Well, well, I have sorry. driven through here, and I look at the size of these homes, and I've lived in the area, and I have never seen seriously children on the street. I really mean that. Okay. I'm not, secondly, I have driven down here. I have never seen an accident of any type. Well, I wish you'd streets. live in my house. <laughs> well, no, just and live there when, I, when we had the accident. I'm Can serious I you, too. I lived on 28th and Canby Street. When I bought onto Canby Street 14 years before that, I knew that that whole area was going to be developed. And we moved off Camby to 39th and Laburnum, and then I moved down onto 35th. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why I shouldn't have stopped the traffic coming over from Queen Elizabeth Park? Who were those people using the street that I lived on? And I had children, and I had a dog, and I had a cat. Mr. Cavanaugh, we are not asking that the traffic be stopped on our it street. Is. It is effectively but, stopped. Right. You know, we, we don't seem to... You, you, we got you're two not different listen. points of view, and no, I understand that's what fine. you're saying, but I won't agree with you, that's all. That's and you fine, don't that's your... That, no, I, but I'm, I'm willing to listen, and right, I think that's I the difference. This? Can I ask this? 96 people, by Margaret Ford's, Alderman Ford's own statement, 96 people said, yes, we will go ahead with this. 96 people now got $60,000 spent on these diverters, which is a $600 subsidy, just what my taxes went up last year to pay for this idiocy. Please don't tell me that. Go to your the city traffic and near we're engineering going, going department. That's fine. I'm delighted. They were the people when we asked and said that there was so much traffic along here, please help us find a solution. It was the city traffic, I guess the council told the city traffic. Do you think we shouldn't put traffic. a traffic sign in here 20 miles an hour and put a couple more stops on? Maybe Wouldn't that's... Have affected the same thing? I don't know. That's not, it's not our... It's, we didn't... I have a bee in my bonnet about these cul-de-sacs in Shaughnessy. No right to have one, but couldn't resist it. So hi-ho we go down to City Hall to see two people, Mayor Harcourt and his NDP buddy, Bruce Erickson. First Harcourt. You know, there's a very serious principle involved in all the kerfuffle in the city of Vancouver just now about diverters. Cul-de-sac has become a cause célèbre. How's that for bilinguality? And this applies to the west end of Vancouver, the many parts, the diverters, the hookers, the prowlers in the car, and it applies to Shaughnessy. And with me is His Worship, the Mayor of Vancouver, the celebrated Michael Harcourt. Michael, you'll forgive me if I take the very rough view that I think you've been conned into these diverters between 16th and 29th and, you know, Pine Crescent and Cedar Crescent to spend $60,000 of the poor taxpayers' money to preserve private little parks and sh snob parts of the city. Now, how could you fall for that kind of garbage? Well, Jack, I forgive you for many things. But not for that. But uh, what I'll forgive you for there is, is for not uh, looking at what we have done as a matter of public policy throughout this city for a number of years. Uh, a good example, and I, I think where we started, was in Strathcona, where we had a community that was going to be ravaged by some freeways and some urban renewal. We turned it around. We uh, renovated that whole community, integrated into Chinatown, but we did, as part of the neighborhood improvement program there, close off two or three of the interior streets between Venables and Hastings. We've done that in the West End where we closed down Chilco. You're trying to con me, Your Worship. No, I'm not. I'm saying that we have, in a variety of different neighborhoods throughout the city, have uh, 
decreased significantly. People that want to whip through neighborhood streets to go from Vancouver to Surrey or from, from Vancouver to Richmond or whatever. Isn't that a fact, Your Worship, that in the West End, one of the reasons for the diverters was the hookers? No, no. They, there's what? Some, there, there are a couple of very temporary diverters there to try and bring some temporary relief to the West End community. But we have, uh, west of Demon Street, put on a whole system of uh, street closures in many parks and closed off Chilco Street and are prepared to do the same thing for the community on a permanent basis this year east of Denman Street. This we've done it. it we've done it in Mount Pleasant. We designed Falls Creek and Champlain Heights. So uh, a lot that's of the different. But that's a new community. Uh, if you're a new community, no problem. On Call this acts as many as you but, like. But we have also in, in uh, some other communities diverted through traffic away. For example, the kerfuffle about Jericho Park and the, the street that, uh, that uh, goes through a portion of the park to keep the traffic out of the, the residents You're to the west of there. You're a good politician. So I'm that. saying we've done it in a number of different communities but, throughout the city, Jack. But in Shaughnessy, you only uh, involved 134 residents of whom 98 voted for the diverters. When Kavanaugh, the great opponent of it, yeah. points out perfectly properly, there are 4,000 yeah. homes in Shaughnessy right. between 16th and 49th Granville on the boulevard, yeah. and he sent out his own questionnaire, which would like mm -hmm. it to be better than the one done by your officials. Yeah, not true. What not, true. not true. Well, what, what, uh, what you're missing is the fact that we have also brought in similar uh, sorts of uh, diversions of through traffic on Pine Street, and on Cedar Crescent, and we did that uh, quite a while ago. That was done a couple of years ago. How many diverters have we got in Shaughnessy Shos now? It's about uh, five or six. I can't drive pi up Pine Crescent anymore taking my shortcut from the top of the 16th and Barad through to Laburnum. No. That's right, but you see there are some streets that are called uh, Arbutus, East Boulevard, uh, Granville, uh, but they're meant, busy they're, streets. They're, that's what they're meant for. I they're want meant to use to be the quiet busy. streets. They're meant to be busy. But I'm in a hurry. I don't want to go line up on East Boulevard. But, but I'm saying that uh, Vancouver was developed on a grid system of streets. Most modern cities now are developed where you have your arterial roads and then you have your neighborhoods are free of that sort of a traffic. Is it your plan? And where it's a major problem, where it's a major problem, uh, we are prepared to introduce measures to bring some peace and quiet to people that are paying very stiff taxes now, particularly school taxes, to be able to enjoy their community and their neighborhood. Does it not look to you, sir, gold mm. season socialist, which you are, which you'll admit, NDP -er type socialist, that it looks like snob protection for some fancy parts of town? It's They've not, all got their own mini parks. What do they need extra privacy it's not, for? It's snob protection. The point I'm making, and I'll say it again, Jack. I still don't because understand it. Because it didn't sink in the first time. No, it because, didn't. because you're on a line of attack and you're a ter just a terrier, a tenacious reporter, <laughs> and, and you want to keep your storyline going. And what I'm going to say is we as a city over a long period of time have brought relief to local communities for terrorizing through traffic. And uh, this is just another example where it's an experiment right now. We're prepared to change it, to monitor it. Uh, on behalf of that, that whole community out there, and it is a whole community, it's coming back before council in the next little while, and we'll have a fresh look at it. But we've done it all throughout the city. It's not in response to a request from the Fat Cats and Shaughnessy. We've done it all over the city and have done for at least 10 or 15 years. But you are prepared to consider now the wishes of the 4,000 residents in that area. I mean, if I live in 20th... That's exactly what the experiment is all about, was to oh. find out the effects, to see the impacts, to see where we can modify it or change it, to see uh, uh, what council can do to try and to deal with the question you're talking about, about you who want to uh, destroy somebody's peace and quiet. You mean thousands in this I'd city. I pay my share of provincial taxes and everything but else. Those are local city streets paid for to a large extent uh, on a local improvement basis. And the, the communities are, are, are entitled to peace and quiet enjoyment. We also have to have a, a decent traffic flow throughout the city. And we're trying to balance those two. In other words, you want all the traffic to use the main arterial streets and stay off all residential streets? No, I didn't say that. I, 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 no, I didn't. I said that those local streets are designed for access by uh, the people that live in there, the people that visit, mm -hmm. the delivery trucks, the uh, garbage trucks, and, and the, the service uh, trucks that have to have access through that local community. Right. They're not designed, they're not built to be used as arterials to whip people around the city at 40 or 50 miles an hour. I know that, but there's a basic thing. The streets are paid for and built by the city. 
And in some way, provincial taxpayers, and you want to deny... There's nothing in there of the, of the provincial money. You're not getting any provincial money in the for, city at all? Except for, for some arterial, arterial highways. A, a small amount for a few arterial streets. But no longer, amounts. no longer can the hard-pressed citizen of Vancouver who lives on a busy street dodge his way home through the back streets if you have your way. No, well, I've said where it's a major problem to a community on a sustained basis and it's dangerous and it's creating a real aggravation for that local community, we're prepared, as we have in other areas of the city, to try and take some measures to bring some relief to those people. Supposing you lived in Rupert and Nanaimo, mm -hmm. around those areas, where mm -hmm. people like myself mm -hmm. use all the back streets because we mm -hmm. can't afford to sit waiting for the traffic lights and the heavy traffic. Are you prepared mm -hmm. to do this on petitions throughout the entire city? We have responded in Mount Pleasant, yes. We have done that for the Vancouver Heights people along Cassiar Street. We uh, are, we are doing it uh, in, in Champlain Heights on Matheson Crescent. Uh, we are going to deal with tomorrow with a request from some citizens down at uh, 49th and Angus to, to bring in some diversion methods there. Okay. We've done it uh, over at the Jericho Park area. We've done it in the West End, Strathcona. Yes, I'm prepared to help people get peace and quiet in their local neighborhood. Good. And it would not be right to call you in the next campaign the Dead End Street Kid. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> the neighborhood-based the neighborhood -based mayor, I wouldn't mind having at all, because that's where I started politics, and uh, that's oh, where I'm staying. That's where I'm staying. Mike, cool the sack Harcourt. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Listen, do you come up for office again this year? November. Are you going to run? Sure. For Good sure? city, sure. Good city. And you'll still be the lone NDP on council if you win. Well, well, two. Listen, Erickson and you are the two NDPs. You, you look at what we've been able to accomplish as a council in the last year in the face of a lot of difficult times. I think we've done pretty well. I'll find I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Read my midterm report. I'll give it to you before you leave. Thank you, Michael. Jack. Your worship. And uh, you will, if sufficient pressure is put on you, lift the diverters. If you change your vote, the diverters could go soon, couldn't they? And Jonathan. What we're going to do is we're going to see the... Uh, uh, the results of uh, the people that are written in, and I invited them. Matter of fact, when it came up before council, I said, I want the people in this community to get involved, to let us know what they think of the diverters, where we could change them, where they could be eliminated, to try and uh, allow, as I say, people in that area some uh, mobility, but also some peace and quiet to the residents of Shaughnessy. Enough. And that's coming back in the next month or two. Right, enough pressure, you'll take a second look. Well, we're going to take a second look anyways. If you'll forgive the phrase. We're going to take a second look anyways. My thanks to your worship. Okay, Jack. The only other member of city council committee that's an NDP -er is Bruce Erickson. And Bruce, I must say, I'm kind of surprised to see you and Harcourt dash off to encourage and vote for the diverters in Shaughnessy. What do they need diverters for? They've all got their own mini parks. Well, we put diverters in Strathcona. We got diverters all over the city. And like Harcourt said, you know, cul-de-sacs are, are uh, a way of controlling traffic, and diverters are as well. Uh, we had a lot of uh, complaints from that area. Uh, our engineers studied the complaints. They came up with a plan. I know, uh, but you only consulted 134 people out of 4,000 in Jonesy. 198 people in, in that in, in that neighborhood, okay? People who were... And 134 good. answered, 98 voted for it. Uh, 135 answered. Anyway, it, it works out this way. 28% uh, opposed, 72% in favor. Of that small proportion of people in the whole of Shannon's. That's right. Well, you're dealing with a neighborhood. That's that's what the diverters are all about. To, are to you keep prepared to take a second look if the total people of Shaughnessy on the current informal survey says they don't want it by a large number? I don't think on an informal survey. Look, uh, we spent a lot of taxpayers' dollars. Uh, 60,000 uh, bucks. Well, no, more than that. Look, we, we had a lot of public meetings. We had uh, uh, committee meetings, council meetings. We spent a lot of time, uh, and, and we sent our engineers uh, to check out whether or not they, the problems existed, as they said they were. Uh, we asked them to come up with a plan, and then we went into the community and, and, and asked for an opinion. Now, the people that answered mm -hmm. by 72% uh, majority said, yes, we're going to try these. But even at that, we bent over backwards to accommodate the 28% who were opposed to it. We said, look, we're going to try them out for six months. If at the end of six months you do not uh, uh, think it's a good idea, if it's not working, we'll take them out. The fact is, though, that uh, <coughs> that's hardly six months, and they're not giving them a fair chance. I went to take one of my usual shortcuts recently, and I couldn't. Surely the roads are for everybody to use. 
Oh, I don't, uh, I don't think that... In the, the old districts, especially. I don't think that the general public honestly believes that residential streets are meant to be used as main arterial highways. The fact is that uh, <coughs> I don't hear any squawks at all in the downtown area, Strathcona, uh, where they have diverters all over. We don't hear any squawks in the new subdivisions where they put in cul-de-sacs. It well, makes it more difficult. The reason I came to was I thought he would be involved in a little bit of local snobbery. No, I'm not a snob. Listen, I got elected to this council, uh, in my mind, to try to deal with all the issues based on the merit. Has the establishment eaten you up? No way. You're um, going to run again? Yes. Yes. And you are an NDP? Yes. Nice to know. My thanks to Bruce Erickson, the indefatigable and intrepid Bruce Erickson. Intrepid, yeah. I like that. I like that. Enough of Shaughnessy. Next up, that lead, president of the trial lawyers, say. Uh, Association. Some interesting questions for him and for you too if you ever get crippled in an accident after the break. My attention was grabbed by a Supreme Court of Canada decision some little time ago in which they laid down that non pecuniary damages which you might get after somebody else has hurt you in an accident, must be limited to $100,000. And Art Vetlieb of the Trial Lawyers Association has been complaining loud and long that this is unfair and unjust. But first, Mr. Vetlieb, let me get it quite clear. Touch wood in the name of goodness. Anybody who presently gets injured in an automobile accident and is crippled for life. This does not mean that the damages are restricted to $100,000, does it? No, of course not, Jack. It doesn't right. mean that the, uh, that the total award is restricted to $100,000. What, uh, what, what is this particular aspect to which you so strongly object? Well, what we're talking about here is the most important thing of all when you're an innocent accident victim and you go to court, and that is compensation for the loss of enjoyment of life and the pain and suffering. Now you it's get your compensation unlimitedly, I suppose, for loss of income and medical expenses. Yes, that you get, and that's understandably something you're going to get. But let me tell you what the difficulty is. Okay, uh, I want to get this clear though. In other words, I might get, whomsoever might get a million dollars for the residual crippling that I suffer after an accident, special house, special attendance and all the rest of it. But there will no, be no more than $100,000 on top of that for pain and loss of pleasure. That's right. Now, in practical terms, you're talking about perhaps 40 to 50 cases a year, not hundreds and not thousands here in this province. We're talking about 50 cases a year in this province. Now, let me tell you what the real difficulty is. We're now just subject to another ICBC rate increase. We had a huge increase a year ago. We recently had another substantial increase, and we feel there are more substantial increases on the way. ICBC loves to tell the good people of this province that the reason their uh, premiums keep going up is because of the people of the province. They're going to court and getting higher awards. They're always blaming the people. Cost of repairs, higher awards, union increases, uh, top-heavy administration, no doubt. Well, they don't talk about the top-heavy administration. You're not concerned with ICBC. You're concerned with what the Supreme Court of, uh, the Supreme Courts do on traffic accidents. Well, let me tell you why. Because what the Supreme Court has done is to, in effect, not say that damage awards are going to keep pace with the economy. Damage awards in this province are going backwards. And damage awards in British Columbia, particularly in British Columbia, because of the way our Court of Appeal has gone, unlike other Courts of Appeal, are now back to the level they were at in about 1972. Now, the reason that we're commenting about this is because we don't feel that the insurance companies are giving it to the people straight when they say that court awards keep going up in, in view of what we know because of our experience in court. Let me tell you, as president of the Trial Lawyers Association, just what the organization is. We represent the lawyers who are on the side of the people who are the innocent victims who go to court. We're representing the people as opposed to the large corporations. And so we're in the courts on a daily basis and we're seeing what's happening. Now, the, the reason this is happening in our province is not because of what juries are doing. And of course, we know that juries are an historical uh, uh, thing that have, mm -hmm. have been the reason that men have fought wars. It's a basic sense of freedom. The reason it's happening is because of what the judges have done on their own. And whenever you start talking about pain and suffering and this, uh, this limit that the judges have clamped on, 
you have to look at the opposite system, which is the jury system. Now, it may be a surprise to some of your listeners, but in this country, there is no absolute right to a jury system. To have a jury in a civil action for damages. That's right. No absolute right. No absolute Does right. Does it depend on the decision of the judge who takes the case? It depends on the decision of the judge who decides whether or not you can have a jury. Because obviously, if I'm Melvin Bell, I had Art Vetley, but anybody else you like to talk about, I can squeeze three million dollars out of a jury, perhaps, but I might only get two hundred and sixty thousand dollars out of a hard-nosed judge. Well, the object of the exercise... That's putting it bluntly, isn't it? No, that's not putting it fairly, though. The object of the exercise is to get a fair award. Now, let me tell you what the Supreme Court of Canada, in their wisdom, saw fit to do. Right. And we're not talking about an old case out of the 1800s or the 1900s. We're talking about a case that came down less than three weeks ago. And just so nobody thinks I'm being unfair to what the, the judges did, let me tell you about the injuries that one of our citizens had. And this is about an accident that happened in Delta uh, a few Mr. years Brian ago. Mr. Brian Lindahl. Mr. Lindahl. Uh, he was in a bad traffic accident, and he was he left with severe brain damage, speech impairment, spastic convulsions, loss of control, hands and legs, prone to fits of depression and suicidal impulses. Exactly. All right. Now, Terrible how much, injuries. Uh, I have the greatest sympathy in the world for the guy. What was his award that he got for the basic damages? Well, some of your listeners may be absolutely shocked to hear this, but the Supreme Court of Canada, the judges in Ottawa, said that this man should be given a hundred thousand dollars to compensate him for all those losses and we think that's absolutely monstrous we think it's a terrible decision and let me tell you that did he not have other damages on other awards on the side for medical expenses or anything else yes mr lindahl had a, a, a reimbursement for his loss of income but what you're dealing what did he get in total his total judgment in Mr. Lindahl's case was approximately four hundred thousand dollars. Now it could have been, it could have been yeah, a, a, a hundred thousand one way or the I other. I didn't want you to sure give people exactly. the impression that all he got was this miserable hundred thousand. No, no, of course not. He got four hundred thousand, which included the hundred thousand. Yes, exactly. Now, the, uh, why don't you get back to that? But let me get something clear. Again, we'll take Mr. X here. He's in an accident. He has dreadful injuries, and he lingers for a year before he dies. Now, even up to now, he got nothing for the pain and suffering prior to his death, did he? If well, you die, you don't get pain and suffering at all. Is that right? That's correct. That's one of the curious things about our law, um, that when somebody does something wrong, if you're drunk and you're in a car accident and you kill somebody, you're better off killing them because you're going to pay less in damages. I, it's always that, bothered me. That's that a one. terrible result. But you're particularly attacking the limit Davy Fulton had up had given an award of 135,000 in this case for pain and suffering. That's correct. A pain and loss of pleasure, I suppose. That's correct. But the Supreme Court of Canada said no, 100,000 is the maximum of that element. And let me tell you why we feel the Supreme Court of Canada did that. In 1978, the Supreme Court of Canada decided to make some law, and one of our complaints about what they've done is that they are not lawmakers; they're there to interpret the law. If the Parliament of this country passes a law, so be it. If the legislature of the province passes a law, so be it. At least they're the, the elected representatives of the people. However, the Supreme Court of Canada, as we all know, are not elected representatives of the people. Nonetheless, on their own initiative in 1978, they said that we've got to put the lid on damages. They looked down at the United States. They felt that things were out of control down in the United States and said the time has come to put a lid on it they dealt with a Mr. Andrews who had terrible injuries. He was a quadriplegic, which of course means he has mm -hmm. really no bodily function, no bowel function, right. no sex function. Uh, Mr. Andrews had to be turned in bed every two hours by trained nurses. It's just a terrible uh, situation for Mr. Andrews. And what the court said is that we've got to make sure that the awards in this country are held down or else car insurance is going to get to be too expensive. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Andrews, for his loss of enjoyment of life, was, was given $100,000. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you go to downtown Seattle, you're going to pay less money for insurance coverage in downtown Seattle than you do in downtown Vancouver. They have juries in Seattle. They sure do, and they don't have any limit either. I'm surprised you tell me that it's the judge's decision as to whether or not uh, a claimant can get a jury to decide the amount of damage. Sure, that, that's a well-known fact of law here in this province, but it's not something that people talk about in the law business. Is it the same across the country? Well, we have perhaps one of the best jury systems in Canada. In some provinces, you can't get juries. 
But okay. the truth, let me just finish on that point, is the simple fact of life is, is that there's no reason that the judges have been given this enormous power. Okay, now this uh, Supreme Court of Canada decision cannot now be overturned except by legislation. That's the way it would appear. Okay, Art Vatlib, and I have other questions for him too. Fascinating topic after the break. Art Vatlieb is president of the Trial Lawyers Association and he's now in the political arena to get the Supreme Court of Canada decision limiting pain and suffering segments of awards to a miserable $100,000. Well, is that correct? Well, we're not in the political arena Answer yet. the question, witness. We're very concerned. Very concerned, counsel. All right, very what have concerned. you done about it? Well, the traditional approach in this country when it comes to lawyers and judges is to be nice and say nothing. Oh. And the Bar Association on this important issue up, up until now has said nothing about it just ignoring it. Innocent victims are being denied fair compensation. The conventional bar groups are saying not a bloody thing. I must say that I'm proud to be president of an association that is not afraid to speak out. What did you say? Well, we passed this resolution. We say what the Supreme Court of Canada has done is unjust and unfair, and that it denies these innocent victims their fundamental rights. And more importantly, we also say that it protects insurance companies at the expense of the innocent victim. And we Are take that position. Are you suggesting that the general damage awards have similarly been clipped? Well, here is one of the other problems with it. In this province, and you're hitting on something, it's a very good point. Our judges in the Court of Appeal have said, not only is this going to apply to car accident cases, it's going to apply to every case. All negligence cases? Every case. So what you've now done is given the doctors a bonus, You've taken medical malpractice damages, put the lid on those. Products liability cases, oh, put the you, lid on those. Now you intrigue me. In other words, for the medical malpractice, which leaves me a quivering, shaking, uncontrollable wreck for the rest of my life, I can only get $100,000. You hit it. On pain and suffering. On pain and suffering. So what our Court of Appeal has done is But said, I might get a million dollars otherwise. Well, you might. That's always the case. We're not denying that you can, you're going to get money for your income loss and your nursing care, but everybody knows that. The most important aspect of compensation, though, has to be for your loss of enjoyment of life. Can you imagine though, what sort of bonus this was for the doctors? Here in this province, an experienced lawyer is going to pay a fee each year to the Law Society that includes a certain amount for insurance of approximately $1,500 a year. Do you know what a general surgeon in this province no. would be paying? About $500 a year. Now you, you've got to do it because some of your people keep flitting with the funds, don't they? <laughs> well, every, every business has got its problems, no question about no, that. No, that's, that's no, that's a very really good it's, point. It's, it's an important point. Now, let me give you this, let me give you that again. Are you saying that in a case now, from here on in, of medical negligence, which leaves me alive but horribly whatever, that the maximum I can get for the pain and suffering aspect is $100,000? You're right. That's what our Court of Appeal has done. And let me tell you what else they've done. Our Court of Appeal, unlike other provinces, has said the $100,000 is a limit and you scale down. So that if you've got a broken leg, you get a, fra you get a proportional share of what the quadriplegic will get. Here's what they did with a fellow who lost a leg, Jack. They took an, a, a general damage award for his pain and suffering that was fixed at $125,000. The Court of Appeal applying this $100,000 rule, and they apply it very vigorously. Let me mm -hmm. assure you of that. Well, it's their law now. It's well, they're making, they're making law too now. Now we've got the Supreme Court of Canada making law. We've got our Court of Appeal making law. They gave this young fellow, for the loss of a leg, they said $35,000. That's adding insult to injury. All right, now just let's switch a bit. I can see some reason. We don't want the Melvin Belli syndrome in this country where for a broken fingernail or a tiny scar on your face you get $10 million. Well, do that, that, no, nobody wants that. No, We're not I, talking about that kind of case, though. All right, now what about another aspect of this case? I can rem remember well, every day you see judgments. 400,000, 800,000. The hockey player got a huge award and you get million dollar awards all the time in Canada today, don't you? Well, not all the time, Jack, but there are, there are million dollar awards. Yeah, okay. Now, when a, when a minor is involved in a large award, the fee, the scale of fee to the lawyer is approved by the court, correct? Yes. Where a, an adult 
comes to a lawyer and says, OK, take my case on a contingency basis, and the court gives a million bucks, is it not a fact that sometimes the lawyer walks away with $300,000? Well, I have never... On a contingency basis. I'm not asking about you. But you know as well as I do that there's terrific money on a contingency fee for lawyers who deal in personal injury claims. Correct? Jack, I would love to talk about contingency fees. But if we're going to talk about contingency fees, we're going to talk about them both ways. We're going to talk about the ones where the lawyers win, and we're also going to talk about the ones where the lawyers lose. But you can see why uh, judges and, and insurance companies say, hey, we paid a million bucks to poor Justin Schnarf, and the lawyer got 300000 Well, the contingency fee system... You'll, you'll concede that that happens. No question, but as I said, if we're going to talk about contingency fees, we're going to talk about them both ways. The lawyer I know who spent six months in court spent $50,000 in out-of-pocket expenses and his client didn't have that money because the client was mm. terribly injured and the lawyer came out of that case there was no judgment at all for his client. The client didn't get anything, the lawyer didn't get anything. The lawyers here spend a month in court on a medical malpractice oh, yeah. It's action. a gamble. So if we're going to talk about the contingency fees, we're going to talk about them both ways. But they, I, want, I wanted to advise people, and you would agree with this advice, that if they're so unhappy as to get a million dollars award, that they can always ask the court to look at the contingency agreement. I was just coming to that. That's exactly right. And Even you know, if they're not a minor, they can say, hey, I signed this deal with my lawyer. He's getting too much, I think, because it may have been an out-of-court settlement. Absolutely. He may have done it in 20 minutes. You can always tax the lawyer's bill. And, and in fact, in our contracts, we tell our clients that you have the right to challenge the bill, and we even give our clients a copy of the law that says you can challenge the bill. Challenge a contingency? Absolutely. Well, that's fair, as long as you do that. One other thing about contingency fees, you know, it's not the clients who complain, it's the insurance companies. Because if the insurance companies could figure out a way to get rid of the lawyers, then they'd really have the game under control. It's not the clients who are complaining. And remember, our clients are people who are injured. Mm -hmm. If we were to say to them, pay us uh, an hourly fee, just like Shell Oil does, mm -hmm. that's impossible. The yeah. contingency fee, you've got to remember, is the poor man's key to the courthouse. And believe me, it is that and it works. That sounds like quite a good phrase. Contingency fee is poor man's key to the courthouse, but you can always check the size of the key if you think your lawyer has done you despite that's the right. agreement. That's right. Well, that's fair enough. Okay, let's get back to your thing now. So 300 trial lawyers in BC now want the Minister of Justice to or somebody to introduce legislation to set the Supreme Court of Canada back at notch. Is well, that we, right? we think it's coming to that. We had hoped that the Supreme Court of Canada would admit their error because in 1978 I told you about what they did with the $100,000 mm -hmm. limit. Mm -hmm. And we really felt that when the Lindahl case came up, and we talked about the Lindahl case, we uh, perhaps naively felt that the court would realize how unfair and unjust this was and they would change what they had done because it's bad. It's Fair enough. Unfair. I think you made a couple of good points. I'm fascinated to learn that a jury is not a matter of right. No, it isn't. The judge can decide. Yes. In other words, when you go to trial on a, on a personal injury claim, you may ask for a jury and put up the security of costs for a jury, but not get a jury. Well, that's exactly the case. Uh, and it's particularly bad on medical malpractice cases because most judges in our province feel that the people of this community aren't able to handle medical malpractice cases. They're too difficult for them. The problem that we have as lawyers is trying to explain in a logical fashion why the United States has an absolute right to jury and we in Canada do not. Uh, one of the things that we do in our association because we believe in what we're doing is we go to public groups and speak out. We've gone to churches, we've gone to schools, we've gone to different places. You, uh, you will concede that the, even the 100,000 limit for loss of pleasures gores your ox. It gores your ox. I haven't heard anybody other than the insurance company people say it's a good thing. Okay, calls to Art Vetlib after the break. Art Vetlieb, president of the trial lawyers. I am right in saying, though, that after the Supreme Court of Canada decision limiting pain and suffering to 100,000, it can only be changed by legislation. It seems that way now. That's correct. I'm quite sure. Yes. Okay. From Vernon, B.C. to Art Vetlieb. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. I'd like to ask your friend there. Uh, we were in an accident in September. There was four, four people in the car, two, a man and a woman and two children. Mm -hmm. We parked behind a half-ton.
semi-full-time truck. Don't give me all the circumstances. What's your basic problem? Well, our basic problem is how do you put a, a standard uh, payment on something with four people hurt in a car? The children got $1,000 and $1,700, and the wife and I are set at $5,000 each. Is that with a direct settlement with ICBC? That's, uh, that's what they quoted, yes. No, no, but did you have a lawyer? Yes, sir. And that's what he recommended you settle for? That's what he recommended we settle for. Maybe that was correct, Art. Well, you can't comment on, the, no, on can't. the case without knowing the facts, sir, but... Well, my wife has a broken nose, uh, whiplash both ways. I'm sorry, I can't hear nobody. No, we can hear you. We can hear you. you Not know, to worry, uh, but... I've got double whiplash. But I'll, tell you the, job. I'll tell you the problem, sir, and you're hitting right on it now because, because of what the courts have done. It's taken everybody's a, a award, everybody's verdict, and knocked it down. Uh -huh. And so the lawyers who are working in the area, they realize how bad things are. I'm sure you're not happy with the, with the uh, way the thing went, but you're not, not the only but one. But that's not the kind of accident we're talking about. You're talking about the really, I mean, whiplash is serious, I know, but... Well, we're talking about that kind of gentleman and his family because of what the courts are doing. They're taking the this, this so-called limit and they're bringing it down to every case. Are you saying that 100,000 pain and suffering limit now applies to the $5,000 whiplash? Exactly. That's the whole point of it, and that's our court of appeal. Go ahead, please. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Fertlieb. Uh, my grandson of 21 broke his neck in the swimming pool that belonged to his parents. What was the damage award? Uh, there were no, the insurance company just said it was, the case was uncollectible. Hold on a second, please. That's another kind of case you can't go into without knowing all the circumstances, no, but, can you? But don't accept what the insurance company says, ma'am, without thinking about it. The insurance company isn't going to tell you you've got a good case, and the, the word uncollectible means that they just don't want to pay any money. But that's a case where there could be a defective design, there could be a, a bad warning, but don't just accept something because an insurance company tells you If you break your own that. neck in your own pool, though, can you collect from somebody else? Well, if you break your own neck in your own pool because of somebody else's negligence, sure you can. Go ahead from Prince George, please. Oh, yes, I had a, an accident where I had a rear-end collision. It was the other car that ran into my truck. Did you keep getting? I was insured with ICBC. And uh, what was your award? Uh, that wasn't the point. Uh, what ICBC said is that I had to pay part of the cost for repairs because no. uh, I was upgrading my truck. No, we didn't get the message across to you at that particular mm -hmm. time at all. Now, did we? We've raised a couple of points of basic general uh, information. And we can't possibly handle what happened if you were rear-ended in your truck and tell you that it applies to this. But Is you, that correct? But you know, Jack, there's a lot of people in this province of ours who have a lot of frustration about the way this system is going. Oh, I and see. These BC dives around the banner. That's, that's exactly. But the insurance company was the winner in this court game. What about this decision by ICBC whereby even if you're acquitted of impaired in court, they may challenge the validity of your coverage because of the fact that they believe you had breached the conditions by having something to drink while you were driving. Well, they're a law unto themselves, aren't they? I mean, they don't... Not really. You're here to protect us from them. Well, that's one of the reasons we have a Trial Lawyers Association. I'm pleased to have it. I think it's an excellent thing for just for that reason. Try another call. Go ahead, please. Yes. I would like to talk about a, a lady that got burnt in a fire, and she got her back all burnt and her arms and muscles tied up. And we went to a lawyer about it, and he said that all that she could get is just what they'd allow her on uh, the... Uh, uh, to be scaled down to, and she won't be able to work or she can't go out in public in a bathing suit or exactly. anything with exactly. all scars. Exactly. Now, just a second then. Okay, here's a lady, we'll say that uh, we don't, she's covered, we'll say she's covered, no matter how she got the, the, the burns. Badly scarred, not able to go to work. On the face of it, she has a successful claim on her policy, right? Well, it, it, let's assume that. I don't we're know. We're let's assume we're that. assuming that. What does she get then? What well, is she entitled to get? This gentleman can practice law. As he said to you, it was scaled down. If a person who is a quadriplegic at 20 years of age and no hope of recovery ever, and for the rest of their life going to be like that, mm -hmm. and the limit is $100,000, and our court says scale it down, what do you think this person's going to get well, for her burns? Okay, let me go through this in, in a little bit of detail. Well, say the guy. Well, say the woman is a trained computer technician, right? Fair enough. And she's 36 years of age, and she supports two children. And her income was 
$62,500 a year. It's a good job. I, well, it's a good job because I want you to give me a big award for it. Right? What award would I get for that for my loss of income, roughly speaking? Well, you have to get an actuary to figure it out. You don't take the $62,000 a year times the number of years she would have worked. You don't do it that way. Okay, she might get seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We'll say. Well, I don't know, Jack. Right, but she I would can't get pull a number of the year with for you there. The, well, we'll say half a million. Uh, without the pain and suffering element, what should she? And again, we're just being hypothetical. Should she get for the pain and suffering for the rest of her life? Well, if she's thirty-six years old, the interesting thing is, she, even if she was a quadriplegic. She wouldn't get $100,000. You know why? why? The courts say, you're older. You're not going to live as long. Mm -hmm. So that the courts right old. there are going to drop the award. Just off on, on that basis alone. Uh, how was she covered, old chap? The fellow who's talking to us. She was uh, on welfare at the time, and they were taking her off of welfare when this happened. And as it happened, the fire was in the building, and she got burnt, and then the insurance from the building. Now, they, they can't find the people that own the building. Well, has she got a liar? Well, we went to the welfare, gave her a lawyer, and he just uh, talks in circles. He doesn't okay. want to get well, busy on it. Go down and see Brian Rolfe at Legal Aid and tell him I sent you, and he'll give you some advice. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. I was in an accident uh, two or three years ago. And the lawyer told me, when I went to him, that I had to pay a flat 22.5%, and uh, that uh, some lawyers charge 25%. And to consider myself lucky that uh, I got that. All right, what was the award you got? Uh, better than 15000 Were you happy with it? Uh, not really. Because Imagine. the insurance company cut down the cost of the car that they had formally agreed to pay for. It was a brand new car. What would you have got without the lawyer? They wouldn't even talk to me. So you did, you got 75% more than you would otherwise have got. Well, True enough, true enough. Good, thanks very much. I think that's the point to be made. In yeah. Jack, that's happening all the time. The minute, interesting, and I know this for a fact with ICBC. The minute you go to a lawyer, they increase the amount of money they set aside for that claim. Oh, that's right. They'll offer me a thousand, but if you phone them up, they'll offer you five. Just about. Is that yeah. fair? No, it's not fair. It's not fair. Maybe the whole system should be scrapped and replaced by a compensation system for life in the, in, uh, the case of serious injury. Well, we've got a WCB board, don't we? And uh, ask any MLA about workers' compensation. Art, you made a couple of very good points. The point being that a jury is not a matter of right in a civil damages case. And with respect, you say the Supreme Court of Canada doesn't know what it's talking about. They're wrong. My thanks to Art Vetlieb, Trial Lawyers Association. After the break.